So what are we going to talk about, Peyton? We'll talk about this sermon you just preached. Oh, yeah, the sermon I just preached, yeah. Which was? Psalm 22. What was the title? Well, I, so just some background. I preached Psalm 22 at uh, another church a few weeks ago, and then I preached this sermon, which comes from Matthew 27, uh, which also there's an account uh, similar, which comes from Mark 15, which a lot of theologians and scholars think that Mark was actually written first and that Matthew just sort of absorbed most of Mark and then added things in uh, from his own perspective, which seems to be the case. So that's why you you get uh, you get parallel uh, accounts here of Jesus' crucifixion that, that are very similar. But in Matthew 27, that's where the sermon actually came from. And it's it's Jesus crying out from the cross. We are going through a series this Easter season, this Lenten season, leading up to Easter, ob- observing and meditating on the this, this seven, you could say six, sayings of Jesus from the cross. So the things that he said from the cross, the words of Jesus from the cross. And the first one is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is a huge huge thing because that is actually a direct quote from the first verse of Psalm 22. So knowing that I was going to be preaching at at one church, local church here in the area, and then preaching at our church in two weeks later, I felt like I wanted I, I wanted to be prepared for both sermons, but I didn't I wanted them to be related. And so my goal was to preach Psalm 22 looking forward to Christ, and then here at our church to preach the crucifixion and specifically Jesus' words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken, looking back at the source of those words, which is Psalm 22, at least the literary source. And so just getting that from from both angles. So that's that's just sort of an introduction to how it came about. Um, but I think Psalm 22 is is a is a really important psalm for for that reason and for others. But I also think, and I've been thinking about the psalms for several years, and as I've grown to understand how to read them and how to interpret them, and and especially how to teach and preach them, it's made it all the more meaningful for me to 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 get into the psalms. And so, it, I would just say if you're out there. And you're asking where where can I go in the Bible? Where I want to start reading the Bible. Psalms is a great place to start. Um, you may not understand everything. There's going to be a lot of poetic language and imagery that you you can't possibly understand without background, without you know s- deeper study. And certainly, by all means, pursue that deeper study. But the Psalms are basically the hymn book of the Bible. They're the song book of the Bible. These are Psalms that would have been sung and read in corporate worship in Jesus' day, um, in the synagogues, in the temple. People would have applied them to their own life in everyday life. They would have read and sung them at other occasions and and even, you know, prayed them uh, as well. So, and it's just like hymns and spiritual songs that we have today that we lean on in times of struggle, in times of need, in times of praise. So there are all these different types of psalms. There are praise psalms uh, that simply praise God for who He is, and, and there are thanksgiving th- songs when God does something for us and it's it's something you know that we we've asked for and he answers we we give thanksgiving to god so there are those types of songs and then there are so many psalms that would fall in the category of lament and lament is is sort of grieving over loss or tragedy or whatever suffering is in our lives sometimes it's sin many times there are psalms in that deal with lament over our own sin and so these are the basic categories of of psalms. The psalms are meant to to do, to teach. They're meant to teach the faith, which is also what you know the great hymns of the faith do. They teach us the faith. 
they but they speak specifically to our circumstances and that's why I think they're so valuable and I think they're so um, people respond so well to the Psalms and have through the years through the ages because they they see themselves in <clears throat> in these cries that of the psalmist so Psalm 22 is one of those lament psalms but it's not the typical lament psalm um, it starts out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? And one thing I like to say about these lament psalms is that we've talked about this. God is okay with our asking him why. You know, like I think a lot of us grow, have grown up in the church thinking we're, we're not allowed to ask that question. Don't ask God why. Do you know, we, we, we don't, we don't know why God knows why, which is true. But why then do the Psalms, so many of the Psalms begin with why, you know, why God, why is this happening or how long, oh Lord, that's one from Psalm 13, uh, which is another lament Psalm. And so this psalm begins, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He feels forsaken. You would only ask that if you think that there's something that could be, that he could do mm -hmm. to change it. Or yeah. if you truly believe that he is good, mm -hmm. if you thought otherwise, then you wouldn't ask that. Yeah. Why? So that I think that's the first application. Uh, he says, oh, my God, I cry, cry by day, but you do not answer by night, but I find no rest. And he says, then he says in verse three, yet you are holy and thrown on the praises of Israel in you, our fathers trusted, they trusted and you delivered them. So he's looking back to what God has done in the past to gain confidence for and faith for the present. And so that's just an, a, a practical thing that, yes, even in our questioning why God, we are expressing a little sliver of faith that we right. actually believe God is in control and he can he can make this right. That's and right. so it's okay to question God as long as we're questioning him in faith. I think a lot yep. of times we think to question God is to not trust him, but that's not the case because the very question acknowledges that he has the answer. That's and right. we may not know it, but he has it, he knows it, and so we're just going to cling to him in faith, trusting that he has a reason and a purpose in it. And I think that's just that's foundational for all of us as we go through hard times, suffering, and um, struggle in life. And the, the the particular thing about this psalm is that there's no hint that I can see of any remorse over sin or anything. So this is dealing with David being persecuted uh, by his enemies, and he's near death. And in fact, it gets in further into the psalm. He says things like... Uh, I'm a worm and not a man. He's talking about how his enemies view him. They despise him. They they scorn him, uh, and and they said they he they wag their heads. They mock him. Uh, they mock his faith. Uh, he delights in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Uh, and then he says things like, um, "Many bulls encompass me." So these these enemies are strong. Uh, they open wide their mouths at me like like ravening and roaring lion. I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot shard, and my tongue sticks to my jaw. You lay me in the dust of death. He is acknowledging that he's he's literally a dead man walking, and um, so th this is a dire situation enduring this persecution from his enemies. And that's the, that's the circumstances. And we don't know the exact situation in David's life, but we know he was constantly on the run, so to speak, from, from his enemies, and yet had the promise from the Lord that, that the Lord would take care of all his enemies going forward, and, and he did. And so the Lord remained faithful. Um, so he's lamenting his circumstances, and he literally feels like he is forsaken. And even though I think he, he probably had some knowledge that he, he wasn't actually forsaken literally by God, but that's the way it seemed. And so he cries out in honesty to God, where are you? Why are you so far from me? Why are you so far from saving me? He says, and then the way he describes his 
his body. Like I can count all my bones. They stare and they stare and gloat over me, his enemies. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. And if you're already thinking about the crucifixion, you hear that language in there. And that's one of the reasons this is such an important yeah, psalm. Luke, Luke walks almost through all of those mm-hmm. and, and points to each of them in his gospel account of the crucifixion. Mm-hmm. Uh, follows that, that path of Psalm 22. Mm-hmm. But he continues to ask, you know, don't, don't be far off. You are my help. Come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. Now, this verse 21 that I just read is important because the way it's translated in my Bible, the ESV, is 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 one way to translate it. Um, and in the NIV, it's something a little different. And in the New American Standard, it's something a little different. Uh, the word rescued can also mean answered. And it is in the the perfect tense. So it's something that that has happened, but it has lasting implications. So it, it its effect extends effect in, extends into the future. So something has happened, and a better way I think to translate it. And I'm not just going out on my own on this. I've looked at the Hebrew. I've looked at commentaries as well. And so I'm not alone in this. But I think a better way to translate this verse is, Save me from the mouth of the lion and from the horns of the wild oxen. And then I would put a big hyphen and then put, You have answered me. And so it's as if something has happened whether in the moment or over time, and I, I've said that, you know, like if I if I ask the Lord, pray for something for, for a long time, cry out to the Lord, I'll, sometimes I'll journal about these things. And then eventually, like the God, will, God will answer and I'll come to recognition of that and I'll go back to my journal and I'll just add something in, you know, on that page, like God answered this and here's how he did it, you know? So it could be that David came back later and added the second half of this Psalm, which is, and this is why this is so, so interesting because most laments are dealing with situations where the psalmist is crying out to God in faith, but he's in, in the midst of unanswered prayer, which is how this one starts. The only resolution is hope. Yeah. is hope and faith. But nothing has actually happened. There hasn't been an, a, a, a conclusion in, a, to the situation. Right. Well, in this psalm, there's a dramatic shift. And he says, you have answered me. And then from, the re- from that point on, verse 22 on, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. And so the rest of the psalm, it's like a lament, the first half of the psalm, and then a praise psalm. It's like two psalms in one. And they're, they're night and day. And so um, that begins the praise portion of this psalm because something has happened. God has answered David's cry. He's answered David's prayer. He's been faithful once again. And, and so that's just significant to point out. He says, you, you who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you offspring. And so what happens is, he, he finds himself in this circumstance and he cries out to God and he's honest with God about how he feels. He feels forsaken. It seems like God's nowhere near. And then God answers his cry for help. And by the way, he doesn't stop crying out for help. He, he goes back and forth and there's this wrestling with feeling forsaken. But Lord, you have been faithful in the past. I trust you. But here's my situation, and I, and look at my enemies, and look at the circumstances. He's struggling to keep his eyes on God, not on his circumstances. So there's just that that honest wrestling uh, through that first half, and then the Lord answers his cry for help and delivers him, and he goes into this praise, and that praise leads him to tell other people about it, what God has done. So it's very applicable for us as as God's people. That when God answers our prayers, we tell other people about it. It's a it's a it's a natural response in when we praise God to want to praise Him with other people, um, not just privately. But He says, "I'm going to go tell the congregation. I'm going to tell uh, your people about what you've done. Even the nations, 
Uh, it gets down into verse 28, for, for kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. In verse 27, he says, all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. Because of what you've done in my life and delivering me, all the families of the earth will know about this, will hear about what you've done, and will praise you and worship you. So that's pointing forward in verse 30 says posterity, that's descendants, that's you know, family that comes from his seed, shall serve him. It shall be told to the Lord, to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim the, his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. And he so has done it. Yeah, it's, it's finished. It's finished. Yeah. And and so it's amazing how this psalm starts out with lament, ends with praise, but that praise, the 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 lament is personal. It you know it's individual because it's David's situation, uh, but we can find we can see ourselves in these situations too. Again, the suffering of a righteous person. So this is not the result of sin. This is this is the result of God's chosen leader, chosen person, and people don't like that. And they're coming at him and they're persecuting him. Saul did that to David, obviously, was one of those persecutors. Um, Don't know if that's part of the context here or not. But uh, the reality is that there's no hint of he's sinned. And we know David sinned. We're not saying David was perfect. But he was God's righteous chosen uh, king. And this psalm particularly doesn't deal with any sin that I can see. And so that's important going forward as we look to look to the cross <clears throat> but the praise portion ends with let's let's pass this faith on to the coming generations and to to see how uh, god is that that's that's god's mission is not just to deliver one person but that that deliverance would become the foundation for the praise of of all nations that doesn't begin and generations here. that doesn't begin here and that that didn't begin on the cross mm-hmm. that started with abraham yeah in genesis this uh, is 12 this yeah. is a furthering fulfillment in 15, of that promise yeah. to abraham mm-hmm. absolutely and uh you know you may be planning to get to it but it just the you know the way you're walking through it 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 just strengthens more the all of these things like what you've talked about David's actual circumstance in mm-hmm. writing this is a real happening. Mm-hmm. And then there are prophetic, prophetic, there are prophetic to elements to it. Yeah. Nuances, um, foreshadowing. Yeah. And then we, we think about Christ quoting, mm-hmm. um, the first, first line. And yes, he was actually living that out as well in that moment. Mm-hmm. But also there's the, the scholarly point of they didn't have, he couldn't say Psalm 22. Right. <laughs> you know, right. He had to quote the Psalm. So they right. would, and that would bring people's mind to that Psalm. Mm-hmm. And he was, he was feeling that what David was writing about here mm-hmm. in reality, mm-hmm. but he was also saying that Psalm, Hey, that's now mm-hmm. this is happening. Mm-hmm. Look to it. This is that moment. And you, and this is the turning point that you're talking about yeah. too. Yeah. So the 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 word I would use to describe what Jesus is doing, and I'm not I'm not I'm I'm not necessarily saying that in Jesus' mind he's consciously doing this, but but he is doing this. He's appropriating Psalm 22 for himself at the cross, which which is the way that people would use the Psalms in any circumstance. They would they would find Psalms that fit their situation and they would sing them or they would pray them or they would read them or they would quote them from memory um, so that they're they're crying out to God. They're using this language that God has given them through his servants to articulate where they are in their life and express their continued faith in him despite what their circumstances are. And I think Jesus is doing that on the cross. This is significant because I don't think that's all that's happening in that moment. Because in that moment, my my view of salvation, 
tells me that in that moment he actually was forsaken. Yes. Because though he was innocent, and I think that's one of the reasons he he appropriates Psalm 22 is because it's not a lament over sin. It's a lament over the perse- persecution right. of the yep. righteous person, and he is the embodiment of righteousness. He was dying on a criminal's cross, though he himself was innocent and committed no wrong doing. And yet, in that moment, he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Not just so that we can stand here and say, look, Jesus is quoting from Psalm 22. Um, I've told you before, like one of our you know, the, theologian heroes has said, I don't think Jesus was in a scripture quoting mood. Right. Um, I don't think it was just that simple. I think he was actually forsaken by the Father, by the Heavenly Father in that moment. Um, and even if you look at the language of, you know, they wag their heads, they, they, make, they, they make mouths at me, they mock me, they, uh, they cast lots over my, my garments. All of this is happening at the feet of Jesus at the cross. And so all of the language that was happening in David's situation gets applied here. Uh, I'm reading from Matthew, uh, but the other gospel writers as well, gets applied here to the crucifixion of Jesus. And so I, the practical point that I made in last week's sermon is that look at, look at, the, look at the language Look at the things that are happening uh, at the feet of Jesus, and these religious leaders are part of this. Who who else in the crowd should know Psalm 22? Who else should be putting these pieces together if not the religious leaders? And yeah. yet they're the ones that are actually putting Christ on the cross because they have not identified him as Isaiah's suffering servant. They have not identified him as uh, the one whom Psalm 22 was pointing to. And, and in their minds, I don't know if they saw Psalm 22 necessarily as a messianic psalm. We, we do going looking backwards. But it just it's, it, it speaks to the spiritual blindness of those religious leaders being so familiar with the scripture and yet so blind to the reality that God's salvation was happening before their eyes and they did not acknowledge it. And so my my practical application from that was that we as believers, as God's people, should not enter into the Easter season and the Lenten season with some, you know, oh, I know what all this is about. I'm familiar because, uh, quote, one of my mentors um, the greatest hindrance to our knowledge of the Bible is our knowledge of the Bible. Bible. We become so familiar with the story that we take it for granted, and then it lessens our, the impact of, of of observing things like the Easter and Lenten season. And where, whereas I don't want us to do that as a people. I want us to go back into the story um, to to feel the weight of what Jesus is crying from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we can ask that question, like, why would God forsake his one and only beloved perfect son? Well, why? I think that's, you're talking about the religious leaders of the time and the, the scribes and Pharisees. That's their question. Mm-hmm. That's why they're saying, oh, you're, you're, Save yourself, right? They're vindic- they think they're vindicated in that. Mm-hmm. They're not putting those not pieces saying, together. Not saying that we wouldn't have missed it ourselves, but yeah, like we talked about before, we have the whole story. It, it's not just Psalm twenty two. I mean, Isaiah fifty three mm-hmm. is tied to this. Yeah. The the Messiah had to come and suffer and suffer. But mm-hmm. to reiterate what you mentioned about what's happening in this in this moment, this forsaking. There's in Easter's. You know, you mentioned Easter. That's Easter sermons have been, I should say, real heavy on the physical part of the crucifixion and the treatment of Jesus, mm-hmm. the what he looked like. And, mm-hmm. and people have even brought in scientific science to say this and this about right. that. And, and that's all. I mean, he, I, it's unimaginable yeah. physically. Yes, yeah, absolutely. But then we also have, we have accounts of uh, martyrs who, Sang psalms and praise mm-hmm. as they went to mm-hmm. be crucified, killed, eaten by lions, right? Whatever. Yeah. So what? Point. How? Do, how are they able to do that? But Jesus, right? Praise all night before sweating, 
profusely and asking to have the cup taken. And on the cross, he says, why have you forsaken me? It's that other aspect, the true mm-hmm. uh, forsaking that actually is happening, mm-hmm. which is the judgment for our unrighteousness. Mm-hmm. And we, if we only feel the weight of the physical beating and the physical yeah. death, we're going to lose that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's what's going to really get our heart yeah. is to understand that that forsaking was supposed to be mine. Right. Yeah. And he's taken it. Yeah. Not only the physical beating should have been mine, right. but the forsaking of God that I will never know now mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. he took it and then he gave me his righteousness. Right. That's the gospel. That's the good news. Christ in our place for our sins, taking our our punishment. And that punishment, as you said, not just the physical suffering, but the the, the Father turning his back, as it were, on his own son, uh, as if he's turning his back on us, but he's not because Jesus took our place. And so Jesus crying out. And so one of the one of the ways that I would say uh, if we if if we ask uh, the question, well, why, why did, why was Jesus forsaken in that moment? Well, the answer is you, like for you and for me and for all those who would believe, who would trust that his death has covered their sins. He, he cried out that cry from the cross to acknowledge, just like the psalmist did, that he in that moment not only felt forsaken, but was forsaken. And here's the here's the crazy thing is why did God intervene on presumably that same hill two millennia before when Abraham took Isaac up the hill, uh, Mount Moriah, which some people believe that that's actually where right. the cross was, uh, where Jesus was crucified. Why did God intervene in that moment and not intervene in this moment? Why did he, why did he, step in and and stop Abraham from killing his own son. But when Jesus cries out from the cross, there's there's no answer from heaven. Um just it just blows our mind when we really think about it that way. Why did he hear the cries of of Israel from Egypt and send Moses to deliver them? But at the cross, Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he hears no response from his heavenly father, the one with whom he had shared perfect love and unity from eternity past. And in this moment, he is forsaken by the father. Um, And I just, the point that I made in the sermon is that we need to sit in that for a moment. We don't need to jump too quickly to what's coming. We need to sit in that, that for just a moment to really feel the weight of what it feels like to be forsaken by God, to, to be abandoned. I mean, and some of us know, this is one of the things I said in the sermon, some of us know what it means to be abandoned, what it means to be forsaken by other people in our lives. And so we're going to be a little more, uh, have a little bit better idea of what that feels like. But as you said earlier, the whole point of Jesus on the cross is that we don't have to endure eternally that being forsaken by God, that God forsakenness, because Jesus at the cross endured it once and for all so that we could have life, so that we could have his righteousness, so that we could have relationship with God forever. And that's the beauty of the gospel. Um, the other thing, and this is where where it, things sort of come to a climax, is that in Psalm 22, and then this is would be one of the biggest reasons I think that Psalm 22 is what Jesus appropriated at the cross was because, uh, and I didn't always think this way, but as I've seen the shift from lament to praise in Psalm 22 and the way the way God delivers and answers David in the middle of the psalm, and then he begins the praise portion, I can't help but think that Jesus maybe somewhere you know deep down knew there's co- an answer is coming like an answer is coming in that moment there was no answer there was silence from heaven but he 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 appropriates psalm 22 because psalm 22 unlike any other laments ends with answered prayer and so it's almost like we talked about this last week that the, that Jesus operated on faith on dependence of the holy spirit and all of that, just the, the way we do, 
though he being God in the flesh, still operated on dependence. That's what it means for the Trinity to be. Um, he was he was dependent on the Holy Spirit, um, and in in perfect unity and relationship with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Yet in this moment, forsaken by the Father. But he cries out, he hears no answer from heaven. But the very fact that he's crying out this cry from Psalm 22, which is a lament psalm that turns to praise because of an answered prayer, it, it's almost like the answer is in the question, that, that the answer is coming. It's not coming in the moment. It's coming three days later, and that's the resurrection, that God did answer that cry from the cross. He answered it, one, because he was pleased with his son ultimately, and because Jesus had fully drank the cup yep. of God's wrath against sin and, and drank it all and absorbed God's anger towards our sin once and for all so that it no longer has to rest on us if we believe and trust in him. And two... Um, so that we would know that Jesus' death actually has covered our sin. He rose Jesus from the dead, and that was the great answer from heaven. Yep. And it didn't come in the moment. It came three days later. And so even practically, we have to trust that, that God will answer our cries for help in his time, in his perfect way. And, and we look no further than the cross the, the 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 glory of Christ's suffering um, and the glory of the answer from heaven, which was his resurrection, that seals all of his work up and and assures us that it is finished, as he said from the cross. What that whole section was it you said Christ knew there was an answer coming or David? I said Christ. Christ. Okay. But I don't know. I don't well, I know. I think it's I think yeah, there's. I don't think there's any question. I was going to speak I just, to that. I, I think him appropriating Psalm 22, I think it's significant that Psalm 22 is an answered, it, it ends with answered prayer. It's, it's in some ways implied in asking, my God, my God, why have you forsaken? I think maybe he wants us to, he, or maybe the, the, the people who would be familiar with Psalm 22, wait, Psalm 22 ends with answered yep. like it ends with deliverance right. yeah and so it's like it's like embedded in that cry is is no you think you think that this is where it ends right but remember where psalm 22 ended with the deliverance with yeah. salvation I, I don't with think god's answer i don't think you need to be hesitant to, to okay. go there okay. and, and the reason why is one he we know that he is well aware of the suffering mm -hmm. because that's his prayer in the garden mm -hmm. and he tells he tells about he tells his the resurrection, disciples, and he tells his, and he tells the yeah. disciples and the Pharisees yeah. that I, the, about the resurrection. So I don't think we should be hesitant to know. I think the struggle for me is to get my mind around the duality, if you could call it that, of on the one hand being forsaken, and yet knowing that it's not permanent. Yeah, because well, I, that. I, Hey, because we're so we so easily jump to oh this won't last forever. Yeah, but we don't know the weight <laughs> of that forsaken. Right, yeah. it's incomprehensible, yeah. and he knew it. Yeah, that if that speaks to us at all, we mm -hmm. should realize that is how heavy that forsaking was. Mm -hmm. Even though it was momentary, now it was momentary, but it also was infinite mm -hmm. because he is infinite God, mm -hmm. and he took infinite sin. Mm -hmm. Like our sin is infinite because we've sinned against infinite God. That's so why so, is the only one that's fit for exactly. it. Exactly. So even though it was a momentary, it was also, in a, <laughs> to be dualistic, as you said, <laughs> it was infinite. Yeah. Uh, so we will never comprehend the weight of that for sake. Well, and, uh, and the other thing is, like, because he's the only one fit for this, this work of salvation, this deliverance that God brings through him, he being eternal and infinite Son of God is the only one who can bear eternal and infinite punishment from God in our place. That's right. Whereas if we were to bear our own punishment, that would be it. We'd be brought back to, we break even. But in Christ, we actually gain. We are actually moved from right. the negative to the positive. And so we, we, don't just, we don't just get our sins taken away and get our, our, our sin debt canceled it's paid in full 
but then God goes beyond that because it would be enough just to just for annihilationism, you know, annihilationism. I say that right, annihilationism. Yeah, just just to never exist again. That would be sufficient um, because that's. I mean, we deserve worse than that, but that would be grace, right? That would be mercy. But God's mercy and grace is infinite because He doesn't just say, uh, "Yeah, you're going to have to pay for your sin." And and you're going to be brought back to to you know to break even so to speak. No, Christ pays our sin debt in full, and we get credit. That's right. We get credited His righteousness, having done nothing to earn it, uh, because He earned it for us with His perfect life, and He paid our sin debt with His life. And we know this because he was raised from the dead. Yeah. And by the way, the resurrection, the resurrection and the sending of the Holy Spirit is the guarantee. That's right. Is the deposit. That's the guarantee. Of the inheritance we have in it. Jeremy, what you're talking about comes back to doctrine. Everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people think doctrine is dry and boring and all this. But all this is doctrine. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when we see that, then we can, we can get excited about it. But we have labels for things and mm -hmm. it's helpful for us to know these labels. It's helpful for us to know what uh, they, what they mean and what they mean for us. And we can always go back to them. We don't have just this abstract concept. We actually have a label of a, of an actual doctrine. We're talking about the imputation of two things, sin and righteousness. That's imputation where Christ took our sin. It was imputed to him he was forsaken for it, and then he gave us, in that same time, his righteousness. It was imputed to us, and that's what you're talking about. Your account is not only paid, but you're actually given an account of righteousness. Mm -hmm. So um, that's not a huge word, but imputation is yep. what we're talking about. And that is, I, th I think, I never heard that growing up. Mm -hmm. My whole life, never heard anybody say imputation until I don't know when. And so... We don't need to lose. If you lose doctrine in that way, you lose the full scope of what we're talking about, the full encompassing revelation. Yeah. Because you did, you, then you end up focusing on the physical beating and, and death. Right. Because we're, we've kind of forgotten about this very important idea of receiving righteousness and paying of sin. The conclusion is what, you know, what is God's word? What is, what is God calling us to believe, you know, in this, in, in reflecting on Jesus cry from the cross? He's calling us to believe that in that moment, Jesus actually was forsaken for us, for our sake, forsaken, um, that we might have this righteousness of Christ, not our own but but imputed, uh, transferred to our account, accredited to us on the basis of what Christ has done, on the basis of Christ's perfect life, earning us that right, and on the basis of us resting in him. Um, G the, another the theolo theological terminology to use here is is substitutionary atonement, or yep. you can call it penal substitutionary atonement. Uh, penal meaning penalty. He took the penalty for sin. Substitutionary mean he took it in our place. So Christ was our representative at the cross. The same way Adam was our representative in the garden and failed and got us in this mess of sin, which is our mess, and we have to own that, as, as our own, even though Adam did it, when he did it, we all did it because he's our representative. Jesus becomes the perfect representative for us at the cross so that because he was forsaken, we can be forgiven. Because he was abandoned at the cross, we can be accepted by God. That's the amazing, um, the great exchange, I think John Stott called it, yeah. is that, that we get he took our sin, we get his righteousness, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. So that's what we're called to believe this Easter season, this Lenten season, to remind ourselves of his death for us, in our place, for our sins. That's atonement, taking the, 
taking the punishment, taking the punishment for our sins, um, paying that debt, um, uh, you know, absorbing God's wrath towards sin once and for all, uh, appeasing God's wrath would be the idea, uh, behind atonement. Yeah. We, we've talked a lot in the few episodes we've done about, uh, asking questions and because and looking for actually looking for answers for them. One of the questions I think that comes up a lot in this, you mentioned earlier, the Abraham and Isaac mm-hmm, story, mm-hmm. the deliverance mm-hmm. from Egypt. Why, why was Isaac delivered? Why, why was Egypt delivered? And so the, that question may be, well, if Christ came later, what about all the stuff that happened beforehand? What about all the people beforehand? Because they didn't, they didn't know Jesus by name. So we looked at Romans three twenty three. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Okay, there's our truth right there. The redemption is in Christ Jesus. So mm-hmm. that question comes in: What about those before Christ mm-hmm. who didn't know Him by name? But we do know. Abraham had faith, and it was what we talked Correct. about. What yeah. uh, accounted righteousness? Mm-hmm. That's the that's the first revelation that I remember. If there may be something before that, of this idea of receiving righteousness from mm-hmm. Christ through faith. Okay, mm-hmm. so he believed God. He had faith and trusted God, and it was counted righteousness. Now, right. verse twenty four ends in which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed public publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith for a demonstration of his righteousness. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's the part that's important. Because in the forbearance of God, he passed over sins previously committed. Mm -hmm. That's that's your answer. Christ fulfilled uh, God as righteous in passing over former sins and counting Abraham righteous. He counted Abraham righteous because Christ was going to fulfill that. Mm -hmm. So there's your answer to that question. Yeah. And as we talked about before, it's 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 our faith in the promise of God to to provide the substitute to provide for our salvation. Uh, just the way, the same way, it was Abraham's faith to provide the substitute. It was Israel's faith to provide the lamb to provide the substitute. Yep. Uh, it wasn't the sacrifice itself. It was their trust in God's airtight promise of salvation. And they were only demonstrating their trust in that promise. But it is God's covenant, his promise keeping nature that is what saves us. He's the one that saves us. He's the Savior. And it's, and it's his promise that we're trusting in. Whether you're looking, whether you're an Old Testament saint, Old Covenant saint, looking forward to Jesus, or a New Covenant saint looking back to Jesus, the salvation is essentially the same. So, but today we couldn't just say, "I just, oh, I just trust in God," separate from Christ, because mm-hmm. we have Christ revealed. Mm-hmm. So we we don't have that option. Mm-hmm. But it is in in a sense the same thing mm-hmm. of the previous fathers of the faith and the. The God's people before, before and, and they did have to distinguish which God they were trusting in. That's right. Whether it was Yahweh or some other God, and so in in the similar way, we have to distinguish who our who our God is, who our Savior is, and yes. and of course the connection between the name Yahweh and 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 Jesus is important too, um, as He is uh, uh, the Lord who saves, but. Um, that's that's an important an important point to make. Yes, sir. We'll close it out with this. The Lord will provide. The Lord will provide, and He has. Amen. Amen. Yeah.